you're going to have to excuse some of the people in the room today. Because, see, they just went away and they had an encounter with Jesus. And how many of you know that changes everything? So you'll have to excuse their excitement. You have to excuse the fact that they're excited to be in the house of God, that they're lifting their hands today. You'll just have to excuse them. See, when you have an encounter with Jesus, everything changes. Everybody repeat after me. Say, God, I'm ready. My heart's open. My mind's alert. Jesus, make me more like you through the power of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's go. High five three people. Say this is for you and then you can be seated. I want to speak to the people that are in our church today. And the truth is you're here, but you're searching. That you're looking for something that just appears to be missing in your life. It's not that you don't love Jesus, but you just feel like there's a gap. There is more. Because in circumstances like this, you come in a room and you see these couple rows of men and and you're going, what do they have? Because whatever they're smoking, I want some of that. (laughs) Whatever they're taking, that's what I want. And, And we just feel like we're looking for something. There is something that's missing. There is a void in our life. And I want to speak to the people today that are looking for something more and talk to you about how to get that something that you've been searching for today. If you have a Bible, let's open it up. Let's get right into it today. First Samuel chapter 16. And I'm going to be speaking of a man named Samuel. Samuel was a prophet. And all that means is he was assigned and appointed by God to speak on God's behalf. And Samuel, his duty right now, he is to find the next king of Israel. So he's in search of the king that God will appoint through him to become the next king of Israel. If you're ready for the word of God today, would you just say, I'm ready? ready. Look at verse four. Samuel did what the Lord said. We can stop right there and be done for the day. Samuel did what the Lord said said. See, here's what I've learned after now pastoring for almost 10 years, being in ministry 20. Spiritually mature people talk less and do more. They do what the Lord says. And I think there are people here and there's this tension between knowing what the Lord said and doing what the Lord said. Because you can know what the Lord says and not do what the Lord says. And for some of you, you just need to get this today. And for you, it might look like this. Right now, in this moment, I'm going to forgive somebody that I've been holding on to a hurt and a pain. And God said, how many times do I forgive? Seven times 70. So in this moment for you doing what the Lord said, it means you're going to forgive somebody. For somebody else, it means that when you leave this place, you're going to make a phone call to someone that's been out of your life that you know God wants to bring back into your life. And you're going to make a phone call. and You're going to start putting some things back together because you're going to do what the Lord says. For other people, that simply means that you're going to start serving because you've been sitting on the sidelines too long and God wants you in the game. It's not about what you can get out of this life. It's about what you can contribute back into this life. For some of you, that means giving. Because how many of you all know that God never called you to be a tipper? He called you to be a tither. It's just about doing what the Lord says. And Samuel did what the Lord said. It's backed up in the book of James, Jesus' half-brother, when he said, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Verse four said, Samuel simply did what the Lord has said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? See, they wanted to know what was about to come out of the man that was sent by God. Because how many of you know that every time God speaks, it's not always to encourage you. Sometimes it's to get your life going back in the right direction. God will encourage us, but sometimes God wants us to kind of get turned around because we've been going the wrong way. And I just want to pause for a minute. I want to tell you that there will be people, God assigned connections to your life, leaders, friends, mentors, and 
pastors and our role in your life is to not only encourage you, but sometimes it's for your correction to get you to go in the right direction. And when these people speak into your life, please don't be offended. Please don't get your feel bad on. Please, please realize that the reason that they're doing it is they care enough about you that they don't want to see you wreck your life. They want to see you go to the potential that God's put inside of you. Come on, it's okay when people correct us. And they wanted to know, Samuel, is this for correction or encouragement? Look at what Samuel said. He said, yeah, I come in peace. It's good. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. He gives them an option about coming to the sacrifice. It's not something they necessarily have to do. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. A consecration, you hear this word, is simply a declaration or a dedication to a divine purpose. And I want to remind you today that God has consecrated each of you and he's got a divine purpose for your life. Now, whether or not you receive it, it's on you. But God has consecrated you and he's got a divine purpose set aside for your life. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. See, Eliab was Jesse's oldest son. And normally the way things would kind of unpack, you're the oldest, everything comes to you. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at, for people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at your heart. See, some of you need to understand that God's not impressed by the facade of your bod. He's not. He's impressed with the condition of your heart. And we care about what people think about our appearance and what we look like and how we're presenting. And I'm just saying that that's not all that God looks at. God looks at our heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. And he's starting to go through all of the sons. Jesse then had Shema pass by. Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? In other words, man, is this all you got? Is this it? Because I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. Is this all you got? And Jesse said, still, there, there's the youngest he said, but he's out tending the sheep. You wouldn't be interested in him. I mean, he's only 12 years old. He's not even shaven yet. <laughs> His voice hasn't changed yet. I mean, he's still talking like this. You, don't, you couldn't possibly be interested in, in him. He, he's not ready. Don't bother with him. He's not the one. And I thought about this. Isn't it interesting that the ones that we consider worthless are the ones that God considers valuable? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that the ones that we want to discard are the ones that God wants to take in? And he sees value in this situation. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. I love this because the one that wasn't even invited to the party now has a standing invitation from God. And I want to just speak on the topic of standing, if we will. I think there's something powerful about standing for something. And we tend to live in a world where we're just afraid to stand for anything because what will people think and we don't want to offend them and there's this whole kind of culture of political correctness. How many of you know that Jesus isn't politically correct? How many of you know that Jesus doesn't follow the rules that everyone else follows? That he's not interested in saying the popular thing? It doesn't matter to him. He's like, man, you can do whatever you want with this. But I speak one thing and I speak the truth. And I'm just, I guess, longing for our church to be the church that just stands for something. That we say, this is what the Lord has said and this is what we are going to stand on. There's something powerful about standing for something. And I even thought physically, you know, whatever happened to back in the days when a woman would walk in the room and the men would stand up. 
What if we just started doing that? What if, what if, this is just a thought, what if just the men in this room, when a woman would enter the room, men would stand and honor her? What about this? And I spoke to the men and some of the other leaders at the conference. And I love the fact that our church kind of gets this. It's okay that when your leader or your pastor is preaching the word of God and we are up here preaching our guts out, it's okay to stand and honor the word of God. It's okay to stand. It's okay to get fired up in church. It's okay to say, you know what? I'm going to honor the word of God. And I'm going to see right now, you get it. It's okay to stand. Don't be afraid to stand for something. Come on, it's easy to sit. It's easy to stay where you are. Stand. Stand in the place that you... You can all sit down. It's okay. Listen, if you want church to be exciting, it's on you. And I want to remind you, when they went back into the grave, they, they didn't say, well, he's still there. They said, what? He's not here. He's risen, and that changes everything. Come on, we serve a God that's alive. I believe his church should be alive. Come on, bring some energy to the table. Come on. Bring some energy. Bring some excitement, man. Let's do this. They stood for the man of God. So he sent for him had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. See, this confuses me because if you go back just a few verses, it says that God doesn't care about appearance. But here it is saying that David was good looking, that David had it all together. David was shredded, man. David was, why would it do that? Listen, here's why. Because it doesn't say that appearance is ultimately important, but it does say that appearance can be important. Wives, look to your husbands and say, baby, you look good. <laughs> baby, you look good. And what I want to tell you, it's okay to look good. Can I give a word to somebody today? Deodorant's not a bad thing. Listen, God created this thing called a mm, toothbrush, man. Brush your teeth. Say, what'd you learn at church today? I learned that God wants me to brush my teeth in Jesus' name. That's what I learned. That's right. I learned that God wants me to be clean. It's okay to look good is what I'm saying. I, if I came out here all scraggly to you, I'm not giving you my best. I want to look good. I want to look good. And guess who else wants me to look good? I care more about what she thinks than you all think. <laughs> Love y'all, but she wants me to look good. So... You having fun today? Because God's about to rock your world. You watch. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is fascinating. The one that wasn't even in the showroom. The one that wasn't even up for discussion. The one that wasn't even part of the conversation is the one God said, now rise and anoint him. This is the one. Here's the point that I want to make. Just because you're not visible doesn't mean that you're not valuable. David was left out by the others, but he was set apart by God. And I want to talk to some people that feel left out because you feel like, man, I'm showing up at work every day and I'm busting my hump and no one even notices. I'm the first one there. I'm the last one to leave. No one has ever said thank you. No one has ever appreciated me. I've never got a tip. It's like I'm just showing up for no reason and you feel underappreciated and you feel like you're invisible. I want to talk to some of the people that maybe in your marriage, you feel invisible because you've never had your spouse tell you thank you. You've never had your spouse tell you, hey, I appreciate the fact that you go to work every day. Or I appreciate the fact that you've taken great care of our children and you just feel underappreciated. And in fact, for some of you, the, the truth is you just really feel left out. And I want to remind you today, I want to talk to the people that are in here and you feel unremarkable, unvalued, and unseen. I want to remind you that your invisibility is not an indication of unimportance. You matter. 
You matter. See, David wasn't forgotten. <laughs> what if I told you he was just hidden? Because we hide the things that we care about. Let me give you an example. <laughs> I've got three daughters. And anybody that thinks men can eat hasn't had daughters in the house. <laughs> because the girls can eat like nobody's business. And I can't keep it up. My middle daughter, Larissa, here's what she does. She's still with us in our house. She comes home from work. You know what the first thing she says? What do we got to eat? I'm like, you just hate. So here's what I do. If I... <laughs> if I buy some food that I really want, It's going to go in the back of the fridge and it's going to be covered up with some paper towels and some food that nobody else wants. And I'm going to sneak it back there in the corner. Why? Because I'm going to hide it. And what I'm trying to tell you is just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Just because you, you can't see it. See, you hide the things that you care about. And we, some of us are here today and we feel invaluable. And I just want to talk to some of the people in the ministry that God has called you to. And there are people here today that you show up and no one sees what you do. You are busting it every Sunday. Can I just talk to some of the people that are in the parking lot? And they're out there every day. Rain, snow, 100 degrees, 50 degrees below zero. It doesn't matter. They are out there busting their hump. And no one sees them. And I want to tell you, just because you're invisible doesn't mean that you're not valuable. What you're doing is changing the world. I, I want to talk to the people that just serve a cup of coffee. The people that are right now up in TE Kids changing your baby's poopy diaper. Just because they're not visible doesn't mean that they're not valuable. I want to talk to the men and women that show up on Thursday that are here cleaning up the pee and poop in the adult bathroom, somebody. Why? Because they care about Jesus. They care about you. So they're here serving, and just because they're not seen, just because no one sees what you're doing, it doesn't mean that you are not valuable. What you do matters each one of us and the kingdom of God is expanding because of your service to what he does I got I got this really cool shirt a while back and uh, again I like clothes don't hate me because you hate me I mean I just do I like clothes so and I, I got it and Linda asked me she said when are you gonna wear that shirt because I normally get stuff I want to wear on the weekend and I said I'm not wearing it yet. I'm not ready. She said, why? I said, because Easter's coming. And I want to save that for Easter. I want to save it for something special. Not that every weekend's not special here. Every weekend is special in our church. But I wanted to save it for something special. What if I told you, those people that are here and you feel insecure, insignificant and you feel like you're being really not used to your capacity what if I told you God's been saving you for something special God wants to do something big in your life and he's been waiting for the right moment to show up in your life God wants to do something special come on tell somebody he saved me for something he saved me for something special He's got a special plan for my life. And the reason that he was hiding you, listen, you thought he forgot about you? No, he was hiding you because he wanted to protect you and preserve you because at just the right time, he wants to propel you into the ministry that God's called you to. Come on, he saved me for something. You thought he didn't like you. You can sit down. He was just saving you. And just because you don't see it right now, doesn't mean that not God's not moving on your behalf. Can I just be honest with you? It's the things no one sees that produces the results that everyone wants. People say, Pastor, 
I want the marriage that you have. Do you? Oh, goals, man. I see you and Pastor Linda. You have no idea behind the scenes how we work it every day. Every single day we battle for our marriage. Oh, I want that marriage, man. You don't see what we do so that we can hang on. You have no idea the battles that we go through, the spiritual warfare that we endure as your pastors so that we can hang on every day. I want that marriage. Do you? You don't see what we do. It's the things that no one sees that produces the results that everyone wants. I hope this is helping somebody today. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now watch, jump to verse 19. Now here's what happened. Samuel just anointed David, young David as king. He's the king. He's got the anointing. He's ready. But the next time we see David, he's not getting fitted for a crown or on the back of a float, waving to all his people. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. What? What would a king be doing with the sheep? See, and for a lot of us, we get this. Because we come to church and we hear a message and God speaks in our heart and we think this is our moment and everything is going to change. I've just had my breakthrough. And then we go home and it's like we're still back with the sheep. And I know that I've been anointed. Look at David. He was dripping with oil, but he still smelled like sheep. Here's the next point. Don't miss this. I don't need a better assignment to experience a greater anointing in my life. Oh, somebody help me today. This happens in church world a lot because we come and then we get fired up and then the next thing we go, well, God could really use me if I was in a different place doing a different thing. God could really use me to my full potential. I'm not really being used to my full potential. And if I was in a new place, if I was in a different church, then God could use me. If I had a different leader, if I had a different spouse, if I had a different job, if I was in a different place, what if I told you that God wants you to experience a greater anointing for right where you are doing right what you do? Oh, come on. That's not one of those churchy things that everybody gets super fired up about. We love it when we go, God's got a double portion for you, man. We love to hear that. We love it when we say, my time's coming. God's about to unleash a blessing on my life. Man, this is my moment. God designed me for this time right now. I've just, I, what, what's, this, what's the phrase? Oh, I've got a, my setback is just a setup for a comeback. No, 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 no. God's about to send some of you back with the sheep. Why would you do that? Because I thought you just anointed me. I thought something just changed in my life. God, why would you send me back with the sheep? Because it's what you learn from the sheep that prepares you for the king. It's what you learn with the sheep that prepares you for the crown. Come on, it's what you learn in the field that prepares you for the fight. Oh, you can sit down. I'm not done preaching yet. 1130 is going to have to wait. See, I want to teach you not to always be looking for the next best thing. Not to always be looking for the next best job or the next best opportunity for your life and always looking down the road. When I get here and when this happens in my life, always looking for the next best church, always looking for the next best pastor. No, no, I wanna teach you that there is opportunity right in front of you, but you've got to live in the space and in the, the time zone that God has placed you in and you need to grow where you're planted. Right now, listen. I hear men, I hear men say this, if I had, oh, if I had his wife, everything would be different. Sorry, you don't have her. What you complaining about? You're the one who picked her out. 
She didn't pick you, you picked her. It wasn't an arranged marriage. Why, I've got an idea. Instead of dreaming about the one that you want, why don't you spend more time with the one that you have? It's just a thought. It's just something that came to me. Something that I've been thinking about. Live in the place that you're at. See, when my kids get older, then I'm going to be a better parent. When my kids get to a certain age, then I'll be in a better parent. No, you won't. Because if you can't figure it out now, I want to tell you, when they're 16 and driving, you're going to lose your mind. you got to figure it out now. You've got to decide right now, in the time that you're in, in the space that God has put you, you've got to figure it out now and use the anointing that's on your life in this moment to help you in the place that you're in. Because it's what, it's what you learn from the sheep that prepares you for the crowd. Some of y'all might still smell like sheep, but don't you discount the fact that Jesus is in you. You might smell like sheep. Some of you all smell like the sheep you were around last night. <laughs> Just saying, shoe fits where... For David, the same anointing that was upon him as a child was the same anointing that was on him when he was wearing the crown. See, Saul called David a king long before he had the crown. And sometimes you have to be called the thing that you want to become before you can become the thing that you want to be called. And he already had the anointing on him and the anointing hadn't changed. Now listen, this is so important. The anointing is so powerful and you need it in your life. But the anointing of God, God's spirit in you, God touching you, the power of God is not always for your promotion. Sometimes it's for your persistence so that you can just keep going on in the place that you're in, so that you can continue in the season of life that you're in, so that the storm that's been swirling around you doesn't take you down, but you're reminded that in the middle of the storm, come on somebody, I'm not alone, that I've got a great God that's got a great plan, that wants to do a great thing in my life, I'm not alone. It's for persistence. I wanna tell somebody today, don't you quit. Don't you quit. You fell off the wagon, you get back on today. You walked away from your marriage, you walk back into your marriage today. Come on, don't you quit. We're almost done. Sit down, sit down. I want to get through this. Watch. David didn't receive the anointing and become a boy wonder like, whoa, check me out, man. I'm ready. I've got it. i got the anointing. He was 12 years old. It wasn't until four years later. Later, he had even heard of Goliath. He had no idea. He was still back with the sheep, shoveling some sheep poop with a crown on his head. He was shoveling some poop. That's a word for somebody right there. You gotta be willing to do what no one else does to get what no one else has. Oh, somebody help me preach. Some of you need to learn to love where you are instead of dreaming about where you're not. Some of you need to learn the love that like love the life that you have instead of dreaming about the life that you want. Some of you need to learn the life to learn to love the wife that you have instead of dreaming about the one that you want. Love the job that you have instead of dreaming about the one that you want. Learn to love the people that God's placed in your life. Learn to love the church that you have instead of dreaming about the one that you want. I feel like I preach the same sermon every week. I do. I feel like I preach the same thing. It's just different in certain ways. But here's my, here's my message every week for those of you that are new. So I can just catch you up over the last nine years. You ready? God loves you. God has a good plan for your life. And not only does God want to do something in you, he wants to do something through you, and he's anointed you to change the world that he's placed you in. That's my message, really, every week. That's it. Everybody repeat after me. Just because I'm not visible doesn't mean I'm not valuable. Repeat after me. I don't need 
a better assignment to receive a greater anointing. I want to close with this. I remember when I was, I think I was 21 years old and I was still living at home and I, I was kind of working in and out, but I really didn't have any money. If you have money and you're 21, God bless you, man. You got to figure it out. I didn't have, I'm still trying to figure it out, to be honest. But either way, I remember I was so excited because there was a moment that I received in the mail a letter that says, you've been pre-approved for a credit card. Oh my Lord. I was pre-approved for a credit card. Do you know what this means? Forgot 21 year old. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have any credit. I didn't do anything to get it. They just sent me a call. They sent it in the mail. You're pre-approved. It meant that I was going to be able to buy things that I could have never bought. It meant that I was going to be able to do things that I could never do. It said that I was pre-approved. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what the struggle for so many of you is? You're still looking for approval. Some of you are looking for approval from your peers. And you just want them to like you and love you and you'll do whatever you have to do for their approval. Some of you, you're still looking for approval from your spouse. You just want to hear one time, like, good job. Some of you are looking for approval from your boss. Some of you are looking, listen, can we be honest? Some of you are grown adults and you're still looking for approval from your parents because you never heard them tell you that they love you. You're looking for approval. And in the midst of all this stuff, what I really believe is some of you are so interested in the approval of people that you're missing the purpose of God. And here's the last point that I want to make. You have nothing to prove and only one to please. You have nothing to prove and only one to please. Stop trying to please everybody else. You have nothing to prove. Listen, your God's love is not based on your performance. God's love is based on His perfection. You have nothing to prove and only one to please. And I've got good news for somebody today. Tell your neighbor he's got good news. Are you ready? 2,000 years ago, God sent Jesus, oh, somebody help me today. God sent Jesus to hand deliver a letter to you. And the letter says, you've been pre-approved. Come on, the debt's been canceled. Come on, he's given you interest on his behalf. You don't have to earn it. He just sent it to you because he loves you. And he's got a plan for your life. Come on, you've been pre-approved. Stop working so hard and start receiving what God wants for your life. You've been pre-approved. I don't know who this is for, but somebody today, you've been pre-approved. Look at me. God loves you. It's not about your performance. It's about his perfection. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you pre-approved us. God, that we couldn't earn it, but you freely gave it to us. I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I don't know where you are today. And I don't know what your situation or your story looks like, but I know that we all have one. And what I want to tell you is that God has hand-selected you and consecrated you for a divine appointment. And you know what? Sadly, people miss it all the time. But I believe there's people here today that has just heard this word and you're ready to receive the assignment that God has assigned to your life. And you're ready to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm, I'm going all in today. I'm going all in. I've been on the fence. I, I've been kind of holding back, but I, I, don't, I don't want to do it anymore. God, I want the freedom that comes only through a relationship with you. There are people here, you've been in church all your life, but God just spoke to your heart. And now if this comes down to this moment, where are you going to respond to what God has spoke to you? And right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed in a holy moment in our church, people that are ready to say, God, I want the assignment that you have for me. Jesus, I'm ready to surrender to you as Lord and Savior. Jesus, right now is my moment. Come into my life. Would you just right now, would you just boldly raise your hand right now? Just put your hand up. Yeah, hands going up all over the room. Right now, there's people right now, hands still going up. This is for you, man. Don't, why, why are you holding back when God is speaking to your heart right now? Hands still going up. 
God's speaking to somebody right now. You're, you're still sitting on your hands. Come on, put your hand up. This is for you. God bless you. Hands still going up. God bless you. Put your hand up high. This is an awesome moment. Father, for every hand that's raised, right now I pray over them. God, I pray that they understand, Father, and begin to realize that this isn't about religion. This is about a relationship with Jesus. That we invite you, Jesus, into our heart. We repent from our sin. We, we throw that life behind us, God. We go in a new direction right now that you've got a new plan for our life. This is our spiritual birthday. Nothing will ever be the same. And because the tomb is empty, somebody help me come on the best is yet to come can we celebrate every hand that was raised every life that was changed today